everyone and welcome to this presentation on pre-experimental, experimental, and quasi-experimental designs. This is part one of three videos. Um, the first one will be going over pre-experimental designs and then the other two are about experimental and quasi-experimental. Before we get started, I want to go over some annotations that I'll be using to describe these various designs. These are the same annotations that are used in your textbook. So let's go over them now. Um, first, the letter O stands for observation or data, in other words. For our purposes, this is usually an instrument that's administered that then leads to some sort of score or scores. You'll also hear me refer to pre versus post tests um, in terms of these observations. And so that's just because um, it's distinguishing whether the observation was taken before the intervention or after the intervention. So pre intervention would be the pretest, and then the post intervention would be the post test. Uh, the intervention is referred to as with the X letter. Um, this uh, in some cases can stand for the experiment that's being conducted. For our purposes, it is standing in for the treatment, the intervention, the services, whatever needs to be evaluated. Oh, so I probably should have mentioned at the very beginning <laughs> that these designs are um, intended to evaluate some sort of treatment, intervention, or services, etc. cetera. Uh, so all of these designs are trying to evaluate the effectiveness of that program. Um, I'll reuse these words, intervention, program, etc., cetera, interchangeably. Um, but essentially, we're just trying to see with these designs, with the research that's conducted in these cases, whether or not um, whatever is being tested was effective. Did it accomplish its goals? Whatever those goals may be. Um, R stands for random assignment. I'm not going to go into detail right now about what that all means because I have a couple slides dedicated to that later when we get to experiments, but just for right now know that R stands for random assignment. Um, N stands for non-equivalent groups. Just like with random assignment, I'm not going to go over it right now, but just know that that's what it stands for. So non-equivalent is just a fancy way of saying not equal. Okay. Um, the other thing to understand about these notations involves the, the rows of letters. So any row, one row, equals one group of people. So if you have two rows, then you know, of letters, two rows of letters, then you know that there are two groups, etc. So here's what a design might look like. In this case, we have one group of people. They all receive some sort of intervention or program, and then there is a post-test taken, an observation of some kind leading to data uh, post the intervention. Now you may be asking yourselves, well, why are you calling it a post instead of, uh, you know, instead of just an observation because there's no pretest in this case? And that's a very good question. The idea here is just to learn the terminology. Um, and in this case, we're sort of thinking about um, post the treatment, even if there wasn't anything pre the treatment. Um, yeah, so just go with it. Um, here's another example. Uh, it's similar to the one above. Uh, actually, no, it's not. It has many differences, um, but let's go over them. There are two rows of letters. That means that there are two groups. The first group receives the intervention and the second group does not. Both groups, however, were randomly assigned. Again, I'll go over what that means, but the R there for our purposes right now means that the two groups were randomly assigned and there is a post test after each, um, after, I'm sorry, after the intervention is given. Now you may be asking yourself, well, there was no intervention given to the second one, so why is it called a post test for the second group? Um, again, it's just sort of the standard terminology that's used mean, in this case, meaning post the intervention that was given the first group. 
The other thing to know um, that's helpful is that time is moving forward left to right. So in this case, when we have, um, I'll just go here um, uh, with the first group. Well, let's say this is week one and in, in, uh, a group is receiving some sort of program. And let's say it lasts for 10 weeks. I'm just making that up. The 11th week after the intervention is completed, the uh, post-test, the observation is taken. Okay, so let's get into some pre-experimental designs. The first is called the one-shot case study, and it looks something like this. And this should look very familiar because we literally just went over it on the previous slide, <laughs> but now it has a name. So let's review. One group receives the intervention, then observations or measures are taken. That's it. Um, yeah, okay. The second one is called the one group pretest post test design. And just like the name suggests, it looks something like this. So again, remember, time is moving forward this way from left to right. So here we have the pretest and the intervention and then the post test. So it's one group, pretest, post test, design. Um, I think I have some words to that effect here. One group, you give a pretest to that one group, give them the intervention, and then give them a post test. Um, luckily, a lot of the names of these designs kind of give you big hints as to what the designs look like. Okay. Um, oh, actually, let me go back. So. Why would one want to do this? I mean, the previous uh, design was very simple, uh, straight to the point. Why would we want to add a pretest? Well, the answer is uh, because we want some sort of baseline measure of how this group was doing before the intervention so that we can compare scores on the baseline or the pretest to scores on the post test. For example, imagine this was a treatment for depression. We have a group of people who are cl clinically depressed. We get their baseline measure. And again, I'm going to use the BDI, the Beck Depression Inventory. High scores mean uh, higher levels of depression. So this group is scoring fairly high. If this intervention worked, then we would expect to see these scores after the intervention to be much lower than the scores at baseline. That's how we would um, know that it worked, or at least we would suspect that it worked. Uh, the third and final pre-experimental design that your book covers is the static group comparison design. And it looks something like this. So we have two groups. We knew that because there are two rows of letters. One is given the intervention, and both are given post-tests. So why might one uh, do this? So if we just look at this first row, so just pretend this isn't here. Maybe I can put something over it. Um, we have the intervention and the observation. So this just by itself is the one-shot case study that we went over before. Now why add this other group with just a post-test? Well, the idea being that we want to see if people are getting better just on their own over the course of the intervention. So if this was, again, the treatment for depression, we would have two groups of people who are depressed. One group would get the intervention, the other wouldn't. But with this group here that isn't, we're trying to account for anything that might happen naturally that could lead to decreased scores. Because ideally, what the researcher in this case would want to see, if you know they want to say that this treatment is effective, is that these scores are much lower than these scores. Okay, so those are the three pre-experimental designs. Um, now let's hop on over to part two for ex uh, experimental designs. Thanks.